All right. Hey, everybody. It is noon in the East. It is 9 a.m. in the West. I am Reed Galen, co-founder of the Lincoln Project, and this is Lunch with Lincoln for Monday, August 8th, 2022. Uh, I want to welcome to the show today Charlie Sykes, uh, Midwestern extraordinaire, uh, writer, and are you editor at The Bulwark? I'm editor at large at The Bulwark. Editor at large, editor at large, which is a big job. Yes. Um, so Charlie, I want to thank you for joining me sure. today. So uh, a couple of things. So last week, as we look back, um, Tuesday, big August primary day, um, at the, off the top, with the exception of maybe Washington State with its interesting jungle primary system, um, this seemed to be a pretty good night for the forces that we would align with Donald Trump and the Republican Party um, from Michigan to Arizona uh, and elsewhere. So give us a sense uh, from your perch um, what you saw that night that you think that we might have missed. Well, uh, if there was any doubt that the arc of the GOP is bending toward crazy, um, it was removed on Tuesday night, particularly in Arizona, where you had election deniers running, winning up and down the ballot. And of course, uh, the purge of any of the Republicans that voted for impeachment continues in, in Michigan. So um, Donald Trump's hold on the Republican Party may be weakening, but there's no question about it. He is still the the 800 pound gorilla um and it, it, it's it's hard to get past that and and i think what's what's striking about it is not just that trump's endorsed candidates won it's that the trump endorsed election deniers are winning that it is right. many of the most extreme um you know big lie advocates that are winning in key states uh these are not just random states uh you know the presidential election you know runs through places like uh, Michigan and Arizona. And if uh, if this is a Republican wave and you do have those people swept into into office, uh, our political landscape has been changed rather dramatically. Well, I'd say that is certainly better. not for the better. And that's certainly been our you know, that's our focus as we head into yeah. the fall or those what we call existential states. In fact, our political team, uh, yeah. because Lake Carrie Lake won the Republican nomination there yeah. instead of Karen Robson. Uh, that moved, you know, right into what we call our existential states, along with yeah. your home of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan. Um, I think Nevada is probably close to that list as well. Let me ask you, um, you know, it seems like, you know, and I'm going to take the, the the Pennsylvania Senate primary from a couple of months ago um, as, a, as a very imperfect example. But it seems like that there's about 30 percent of what would be called the rump Republican Party. It's probably what I grew up with, what you were, yeah. you know, what you were a part of. Then there's that big middle of Trump. But then there's like that third on the, I don't know if it's the back end or the bottom, that's like ultra MAGA, right? right. They, they've sort of even transcended him. And I feel like Carrie Lake is sort of, uh, and you know, and and Doug Mastriani and, and, and Fincham, who's running for Secretary of State in Arizona, are sort of the exemplars of that. I mean, do, do you exactly. believe that that's a, 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 a roughly good breakdown of it? Yeah, I think it probably is. And 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 your point about the the, the Trumpists who have sort of gone beyond Trump uh, him, himself is really a case. I mean, Carrie Lake is, uh, you know, to say that she's out there is putting it mildly. Even Donald Trump has has uh, sort of, you know, said, you know, I'm amazed how she brings this up in private, uh, the 2020 election. I mean, so when you're actually crazier than Donald Trump, uh, that gives you an indication. Uh, so, yes, um, you are seeing this and you're seeing something that that uh, I think will survive Donald Trump and that may not actually be in Donald Trump's complete control anymore. I mean, that's that's also part of the problem. You know, you start a prairie fire and you may think it's a controlled burn, um, but it gets out of hand. And I think that's we're very close if that has not already happened in the Republican Party. Well, I, I think that's right. So let, let me I want to stick to Arizona for a second before yeah. before we move up to Michigan. So um, in the wake of Lake's victory, um, Doug Ducey, the governor of, of um, Arizona, he supported Karen Robson in that race, but he's also chair of the Republican Governors Association. So the Republican Governors Association endorses Lake or, you know, a pre, you know, thank you for your, your yeah, victory, but he doesn't sign it. He has Kim Reynolds, the governor of Iowa, who's the vice chair of the RGA. So what is it? I mean, Ducey's leaving office, right? He's not likely electable in right. any primary anytime soon. So why, why, and, and I understand that like he's got a broader job of electing Republican governors, but 
what 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 breaks these people of their cowardice? Is it is it even possible, or should we just write them off? I, I think it, at this point, it's that muscle memory of, of party unity. I mean, uh, th that I thought was striking what happened in Arizona. I, I thought what happened in Michigan was was also uh, striking. So Peter right. Meyer, who votes to impeach Donald Trump for his role in January 6th, who, um, you know, describes the, these, this attack as uh, an existential attack on democracy, um, is defeated by a, a real, you know, MAGA goofball. Um, right. And what does he do the next day? He shows he shows up at a unity dinner because that's what Republicans have always been doing. And look, you and I have lived through all of this. We 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 watched in 2016 where Republicans who said that you know Donald Trump was uh, completely un, unsuited, unfit to be president, decided that their party loyalty uh, trumped everything. And that's been the case for the last five years, six years. And with very very rare exceptions, it's not changing it. But, you know, Doug Ducey understands. Uh, that Carrie Lake is is an extremist. She's reckless. Uh, she's uh, de deceptive. That she's completely unqualified and unsuited to be governor, um, and that many of the things that she's talking about doing, you know, jailing Anthony Fauci, jailing people involved in the election, overturning right. the election, are, um, are 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 completely you know uh, batshit crazy. Um, but you know, there is that that partisan pull. So one of the things that I'm interested, and in, I'm glad you asked that. Is you know in in Pennsylvania you saw the the primary electorate very evenly divided in Arizona very evenly divided here in Wisconsin we have a gubernatorial primary tomorrow right. that has really become very very bitter and you do wonder what sort of damage is being done to the Republican Party by Trump's insistence on loyalty that you know these divisions do they leave um, you know hurt feelings um, will they translate into November? Or will the Republicans do what they've done so often in the past and decide they're going to put party over country? And so far, we've seen uh, we've seen the latter. Well, yeah. And the, just to go back to Michigan briefly, the Meyer thing was, uh, you know, I guess, Charlie, we should just stop being surprised. Yeah. <laughs> right? Maybe I, we yes. just make everything easier. Um, but, you know, Meyer's another one of those guys, right? Like, he's probably unelectable ever again in the Republican yeah, right. Party. And this is not a guy like this is guy who comes from like a money, a gold plated Michigan family. Right. It's not like if he isn't a member of Congress making one hundred eighty five thousand dollars a year, he's like bereft of any options economically. Right. Like he could do right. whatever he, he wanted, to, needed. but right. he still chose to do this. And I don't get it. Well, you can't get a character transplant by being an elective office. And and I, I think the the. Um, the early indicators of what was going to happen with Peter Meyer were pretty obvious in that Tim Alberta piece where he did the profile right. of him after he voted for impeachment, but then described how Meyer had decided that he needed basically to turn turtle on this, that he would, you know, keep his head down. He wouldn't talk about it anymore. He'd clearly been intimidated, had been broken. And I don't know whether he thought that, you know, if you, you if you sort of become mealy mouth, that somehow that would provide uh, some protection. It didn't. Um, but you know, you make an interesting point. He doesn't need this. So why does he feel the need to continue to self-humiliate? The contrast between Peter Meyer on the one hand and Liz Cheney on the other is so dramatic. It, it, it's, you know, I, I was talking about this earlier um, t today with a, with, a, with, a, with a friend that I still can't get over Dick Cheney, you know, doing that 60 second ad where he looks in the camera and right. says, you know, Donald Trump is a liar. These people are all out of bleeps to get. They right. um, they are confident enough in themselves and their principles that they are right. going to we're not going to back off. We are not going to be bullied. We're not going to be intimidated and we may be defeated, uh, but we're going to lose with uh, with our principles and our conscience intact. You know, P Peter Meyer tried to kind of walk the, the line and so he, you get sort of defeat and dishonor. Well, and you, you've seen this story over and over and over again. Right. You're right, Reed. I mean, wh why should we be why should we be surprised? Um, but the, but the, but the mealy mouth walking it back, trying to have it both ways, especially in this time, it never works. It never works. To your point, yeah. you lose and then you're then you're humiliated because now you're trying to abase yourself to someone who first just defeated you. Right. So, I mean, you know, in in either Trump's individual mind or the MAGA yeah, mind, I, Large. Like they think you're a loser. They already thought you were disloyal. Yeah. Right. And now they now you've made their point for them. 
You know, maybe it's naive um, because I, I certainly understand um, the draw of power and prestige and being relevant. I mean, I, I, I get that. It's you know, it's, this is not a, a new thing that people will say and do what it takes to, to stay in right. office. On the other hand, I am I am struck by the number of people that you would assume just have like a little bit of dignity that they would want to keep intact, a little bit of self pride that they wouldn't want to abase themselves and humiliate themselves. And right. um, I, I don't want to get ahead of where, where we're going here, but but you know I was thinking about this whole you know sucking up to you know maybe if I just appease them, maybe if I just throw you right. know, the, the baby alligator red meat, it won't grow into a huge alligator and come out and, and eat me. Perfect example here in the state of Wisconsin, which you're going to see play sure. out uh, here tomorrow. The Speaker of the State Assembly, Robin Voss, um, who's, who is not an originally a Trumpist, but has done everything he can short of breaking the law to right. kiss up to Donald Trump, to appease Donald Trump, uh, to go through the motions, creating bogus investigations into non-existent election fraud, fraud uh, um, flew down to uh, you know, uh, kiss the ring at Mar-a-Lago, you know, posted a picture of himself sucking up to Donald Trump on his plane. And right. amazingly, it didn't work because Donald Trump is now coming here to Wisconsin and endorsing Robin Voss's opponent because Voss, as the Speaker of the State Assembly, uh, is refusing to decertify the 2020 election, which which is not a thing. Done. It is not right. a thing. And so he said, it's not a thing. It just can't be done. He's tried to explain that. And yet Trump sees the weakness, figures, if you won't do exactly what I want, I will I will try to d destroy you. So that'll be a subplot to watch in tomorrow's Wisconsin primary, the most powerful legislative Republican facing a primary challenge from this obscure candidate who would actually ban contraception. Not just not right. not he's, he's not just a an election denier. He is. I mean, this guy is Fruit Loops, um, but he has the support of the former president of the United States. And and I will say that you have a lot of Republicans here who are going, you know, this is terrible. You know, that, you know, we should win everything here. We're we're feeling the wind at our back. We're feeling kind of jiggy about the midterm elections. And here comes right. Donald Trump and he is requiring us to be as crazy as possible. And he is spending his time attacking other Republicans. But I'm, you know, I'm sorry to say that my guess is that they will get over it as they've gotten over it in the past and rally around even the most extreme nut jobs. And then they will have to live with that. So bef before we get to who, how you're going to, you know, yeah. forecasting the Wisconsin election, um, you brought up something which is um, in Kansas last week, um, an abort, you know, a, a ballot measure to you know, ban abortion in the state yeah. constitution. Um, lost by 20 points yeah, in Kansas, true. right? Not Washington state, not New York state, right? But Kansas, uh, which meant, you know, and Kansas is a relatively speaking, still homogeneous state, right? Mostly white, conservative. Um, but I feel like it's sort of that old prairie conservative, right? It's the, right. it's Dole, Eisenhower, Nancy Cassebaum, right? It's not. So I think there's also a, a, a fundamental decency that runs through the state. Yeah. Do you think that a lot of these candidates, whether or not they're for U.S. Senate, U.S. House or governor or any any place where abortion might be an issue um, are rethinking their idea about, you know, they're going to go all the way because Tudor Dixon, yeah. who just won the, the Michigan gubernatorial nomination, had said before she was she, before she won her election that, you know, uh, no exceptions. Right. Yeah. Incest, you know, rape, uh, life of the mother. Do you think that now they're going to try and remoderate that because they're like, oh, God, you know, suburban suburban <laughs> voters like that stuff. Have the libertarians reappeared? Right. Like, Charlie, what, right. What, what, if anything, can Kansas, if anything, tell us about these other Republican candidates and what they'll have to do on that issue? Well, the Republicans might want to change the subject or might want to uh, moderate their position. I don't know that they're going to be able to do that because they're on record and there's been this race to the extremes and their base, their constituency is demanding all of that. So it's going to be hard for them to unring that that bell. Look, I mean, the Kansas numbers were just truly really extraordinary. Uh, uh, Democrats clearly were engaged and were motivated, which is a key takeaway, uh, because there was a big question, would abortion be enough to get Democrats out? The answer is yes. But also, we found out that Republicans are quite divided on this issue. And, uh, you know, as I wrote in my newsletter, um, th the amazing thing was, Lordy, on this issue, there are swing voters. 
And right. if I'm a, if I'm a Republican, I start to realize that I am very vulnerable on this. What they did in Kansas was very, very smart. Um, they didn't double down on the usual rhetoric that you might hear on cable television about oppression of women or, or you know, Christo fascists. They actually spoke to Kansans where they were. They used conservative libertarian language. They right. talked about government mandates, government regulation, invasion of your privacy. And then they did this really interesting rope-a-dope because conservatives have been, you know, running around saying, you know, um, my body, my choice when it comes to vaccines and masks. And what what happened is, is that you had the pro uh, pro abortion rights folks uh, say, hey, you know, do you really want if, if you don't want the government to tell you about vaccines or or masks, you certainly don't want them here. In some ways, the right has softened themselves up on all of this. So my point is, we, we learned a couple of things. Number one, um, and, and you, look, I, I you you know this better than I do, but. Yeah, a referendum is going to be different than a you know sure, candidate course. race. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to vote for um, you know a, a Democratic candidate for Congress or for Senate. But um, what this does show is that this really is a wedge, a wedge issue, whatever you might have thought. Uh, secondly, that uh, there are gettable voters. Uh, I, th I think it was very striking the number of counties where the abortion rights folks won. Uh, in counties that uh, Donald Trump had won easily. So there, you know, I, there are people in American politics, I'm sure you run into them, who believe that there are no swing voters, that no one's ever persuadable. Um, all we should do is simply, you know, you know, preach to the choir, uh, get the, the base ginned up. What Kansas showed us that is that if you message intelligently, if you treat people across the divide with respect, um, you can actually move people. And I think that really ought to scare Republicans. I think it ought to uh, you know, be a signal to them that what played well in the primaries um, or on Fox News or on talk radio is not necessarily going to play well in suburban areas, but also in rural areas. So um, I think this, this changes the map. I think it changes the possibilities. Um, I don't think Democrats should think this is a magic bullet. Or right. that it translates directly into midterm votes, but um, this really did turn the conventional wisdom on its head um, in a rather in a rather dramatic way. I thought. I mean, I was surprised. Were you surprised? I mean, well, of I course, surprised. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Eastern Kansas has has had a lot of in migration. Right, it's that western edge of the Kansas City suburbs yeah. now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was surprised. Um, but you know, I think the other part too, Charlie, that you make a good point on, and I had a conversation with a a very large Democratic donor about this uh, three or four weekends ago, is they said, do you want purity or do you want to win? Right. And they sort of, well, I guess I want to win. I'm like, you don't sound like it. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I think you make the right Jeez. point, which is, do you want to win? Do you believe that being pure and losing leaves you in a better spot than, as you said, Charlie, in Kansas, speaking to Kansans where they are about right. this issue? in ways that they can understand um, using, you know, what, you know, what I think we have all done when, when we are trying to speak to, you know, our former, you know, party mates, which is the iconography, the ideology, right? right. Because it's still in there, right? It's still in there. It and I think especially for older voters, um, you know, they, they probably don't like what they see. They don't like the ugliness. They don't like, they, this is not the country they frankly helped build. Right. And so I think that there is a lot to say. It doesn't mean you have to be a Republican. That's sometimes no, the rejoinder. No. Right. Give you. No, it, it, it just means that if you if you figure out what are the values that might motivate people and then talk to those values, um, you know, I, I actually up until, you know, up until the, the, the Kansas vote was beginning to think that, you know, this issue was not going to play, um, you know, the way I, you know, there, there was not going to be an effective weapon because because so many of the Democrats were, I, were, were bad at messaging. I mean, they they were not watching, you know, looking at the polls that that people are very, very conflicted. So if, if Democrats are really going to be, you know, pushing purity or they were talking about, you know, you know, let's celebrate our abortions. Let's let's assume that everybody on the other side, um, you know, hates women. Well, you know, that's going to shut down the debate. It's not going to open it up. And whoever was in charge of the messaging in Kansas was extremely smart. 
Um, they were extremely savvy. They, they really paid attention. And I'm hoping that people download those ads and look at them because I thought of them as a master class for how to win an election that nobody thought you could win um, and, and move people. Um, and, and again, this is important and this may translate into other issues because I think that there is that sense that 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 everything is absolutely set in concrete and that you can't persuade you can't there's no argument that you can make because these people are lost well apparently not and because if you can win in a vote like this on the abortion issue in kansas that ought to open up your sense of what's doable well also you know this is we you know rick likes to say this is the game of small numbers right we don't need all republican exactly. voters we just need enough of it. Right. And I think that it, and it's, you know, I think you're right, though. I think that swing voters are swing voters. I mean, even when you came up in, you know, what I call the before times, you could assume, OK, we'll get 45. The Democrat will get 45. And there's 10 percent in the middle. And we need 50 percent plus one of those. Right. Um, I guess, you know, the difference is, is that the that the 45 percent of the Republicans is, you know, is is glacial. It's locked in. Um, but that doesn't mean they get over the line on that alone. Um, and, and I think that the other part, too, that, that you said when I first asked the question is the, the, the likes of Carrie Lake and the likes of Doug Mastriano, much like Trump, will they cannot moderate. Um, they will they will when given the choice, they will right. always double, triple down because any moderation then, Charlie, displays weakness, which then makes all of the the super ultra mega you know, zombie types say, well, they're just like everybody else. And remember, they're nihilists. They don't care anyway. Like, this right. is not about, right? This is no. about power. Yeah. So, well, and also not, not every candidate gets to define who they are. Um, right. You have your opposition that will define who you are. So if you've taken these positions, if you have a record um, in a state like Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania or, or Arizona, you can drop $10 million saying, you know what this person has said about this and let's run the tape. Let's bring the receipts. Right. And that's what's going to happen. Um, I, I think so, uh, particularly on the, on this issue. Uh, look, uh, I, I think the dynamics of the abortion issue have changed dramatically since the Supreme court came down because whatever the polls showed beforehand, it was sort of, it was that was the before times when it was all make believe. And it's only been the last couple of months that people have really had to confront a reality they haven't had to confront for 50 years, which is this is really going to happen. They are really going to do this. And so anyone right. who thinks that public yeah. opinion is not movable hasn't really, I think, you know, taken into account the fact that it takes a while for people to realize, wait. Something might happen that literally my entire life I never thought was remotely possible. And that's going to change well, the dynamics. And in a thing like the Dobbs decision, that's sort of a that's sort of a broad based decision. But then we're starting to see the the literal and individual outcomes of this, whether or not it's the right. stories of women going to hospitals with ectopic pregnancies and the doc, the yeah. ER doctors having to call a lawyer. Right. Like not a great way to operate a, a medical system. Um, or the story of the of the ten year old little girl in Ohio, right. which I think, really, aside from the horror of that crime um, and the and the recovery that she will have to do for the rest of her life, is how quickly the forces of you know the reactionary right, I guess, were willing to call it a hoax for their own benefit, which I well, think is also right. something that hasn't been really reported that much. Well, as 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 you know, I mean, part of this fight is going to be who succeeds in painting the other side as the most extreme. Right. And I, I, I just get the sense that right now it is the Republicans that are just not really worried about this because they are adapting the most extreme possible positions. And the fact that you've had some politicians who come up with rationalizations for why a 10 year old girl who had been raped should not get an abortion. You really want to right. debate that? I mean, is that really what you want to debate? I don't think the Democrats should want to debate. Do you really want late term abortions? Because that's sure. that's very, very rare. But Republicans should not want to be debating rape, incest, life of the mother. So, um, you know, look, I've been involved in this debate for many, many years. Uh, I've been very active in the pro-life movement. And I have to say that until about five minutes ago, um, virtually no one was taking the position 
virtually no elected official was taking the position, yes, I would um, eliminate exceptions for rape and incest. But then again, it was all free. It was it was a they, they had a, right. you know, a, a free shot. Now it's real. And I think that there's a certain unpredictability in the politics. And you saw that in Kansas. Well, certainly unpredictability has been uh, <laughs> the norm. Um, so um, I want to I want to switch topics, though, to the extreme part of that, which is last week in Dallas, Texas, uh, the Hungarian prime minister, Viktor Orban, gave a speech. Um, there was a follow up to a speech that he gave in July uh, that was that was I'll call it Hitlerian. Yes. In tone. Um talking about race mixing, right. um, you know, and, and a lot of stuff that if you read, um, I'm, I, I happen to be a nerd, so I'm reading Hannah Arendt's, uh, yep. you know, Origins of Totalitarianism. I mean, stuff on goes my back, desk. Yep. Yeah, it goes, it goes back to the late 1800s, early 1900s. I mean, these are not new ideas, Charlie. They're not new theories, yeah. but they've been repackaged in yet another sort of fleshy, you know, bad haircut guy. Um, and he's bringing this stuff to America and people are standing and cheering for it. No, if you want to really get an indication of what's happening to uh, the right wing in America, uh, you know, this week, C last week, CPAC was a perfect example of it. You know, that you have this organ. I mean, remember when American conservatism celebrated American exceptionalism? Now, who's the rock star? This authoritarian fascist wannabe from Hungary who is, you know, comes to this country to talk about his illiberal policies, his anti democratic policies. And this is right on the heels of this speech. And I want to underline this. This was not a gray area. This is not an ambiguous thing that he did when he talked about race mixing. He cites this book called Camp of, The Camp of the Saints, which is well known in white nationalist circles. Because it's basically um, racist pornography, the rawest kind of thing. And he went out of his way to say what a wonderful book it was. So um, we've gone from a conservative movement that talked about, you know, America being the beacon of freedom to say, no, can we be more like this Eastern European country, which has been, um, you know, vilifying immigrants, gay people, uh, people, brown people who have been attacking universities and the media. So it, it, it's also worth keeping in mind what's happened that uh, Liz Cheney or a Dick Cheney would be booed off the stage at the same CPAC conference that embraces this post-liberal, illiberal, authoritarian, Hungarian strongman. So what does that say about where we're going? Can, uh, let me let me ask a, a, an off, uh, an adjacent question. What happened to libertarians? Where the hell did they go? Well, you like, know, for libertarians, like they think stop signs are oppression. So like that they should be losing their minds about this stuff. Well, they ought they ought to be. There's a distinction here, obviously, between people with libertarian ideas who can be very, very reasonable, like Reason magazine. Right. right. Um, and then there's the Libertarian Party, which has always been kind of crazy. It's kind of been a collection. There's always, of there's always a guy in his underpants playing a guitar on the stage. Exactly. Exactly. But I do think that leaving aside libertarian with a with a big L, there's a, a potential for a libertarian moment in American culture, particularly as you have the right people like, you know, the the Ron DeSantis of the world now rather blatantly showing their willingness to use government power to punish the private sector or impose these kinds of, of mandates. So I, I think that there's still a libertarian streak in Americans. Um, that that and it was interesting that this really was tapped in in Kansas. But you're right. Um, where are the libertarians? Where are the people who want to think about this? I, I find it fascinating listening to conservatives who will always sort of walk through, you know, how great America is and how they are the constitutionalists. And yet when it really comes to the question of, well, will you actually defend and uphold the Constitution and the liberal constitutional republic that it created, or are you prepared to abandon it? And you know, obviously, we've we've seen where that where that goes. Right. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Live TV here. There's a phone going off in the room where I'm uh, where I'm uh, recording. So we'll just push on through that. Sure. Um, so, Charlie, before I let you go, talk to me a little bit about last week. You recorded a podcast with. 
the the folks who have just launched the forward party yeah. um which uh with with for all uh you know for full disclosure i used to work for sam the serve america movement yeah. that's one of the three uh three groups that came together so give us a sense of of after talking to them and i know i know miles and i know the sam guys right. and i've met yang yeah um, and I, I I remember I remember Whitman from years ago. My parents were in DC. Um, so give us a sense of what you thought of them. Well, okay. So I talked to Andrew Yang and I talked to uh, Governor Whitman because I wanted to see what their you know what what, what their their case was. I'm open to the idea of a third way. I mean, I like the concept of breaking the duopoly. The fact that we need to reform it. The fact that that you know we do have a rigged dysfunctional system. So I'm open to the people who are saying, can we look at an alternative? Um, and, you know, I've been affiliated with some of these organizations as, 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 as well. And I understand that, that to a certain extent, it is tilting at windmills. Um, so I wanted to see whether, you know, they had this idea had gelled. And uh, I will say that I am unpersuaded um, right. that this thing um, is going to be as uh, significant and impactful as they say. You got some very, very smart people who are very passionate but I think that there's an inherent flaw in thinking you can have a new political party that has no positions on anything um, other than, say, ranked choice voting. At some point, you have which, to choose. Which, when you start explaining it to people, their eyes glaze over. So Yes. Yeah. I mean, the reality is the number of people who care about these reform issues, and I care very deeply because I am a nerd and a wonk, but we are right. a very, very small subset of a small subset. And so right. do you, can you build a political party around this? I mean, I, I think there's there's the reason I don't want to I, I don't want to you know drop on them from a great height is because I think I am part of that exhausted middle. The people who look around and say, why should all of the incentives in our political culture um, reward the extremes, the most uh, the most radical, the least responsible players? The system is not working. There's a reason why people don't have any faith. So um, I'm open to that idea. I'm not sure that these guys have come up with it. Well, you know, I mean, look, I've traveled a fair bit, as I'm sure you do, and talked to lots of folks. And, you know, what you hear from Democrats is that I don't really like my own party, but I'm certainly not a Republican. Right. And, um, you know, Republicans say, well, I don't like my own party. I don't like Trump, but, you know, the Democrats are socialists. I don't want anything to do with them. Who's the new person? Who's going to lead us out of the darkness? Right. Who's going to be Moses in the desert here? And, you know, I don't have a lot of answers, but I do think, again, having spent a couple of years in that world, yeah. um, the independent reform space, which, as you noted, is filled with people who are trying to do their best in a, right. in a in an environment where, let's be clear, both parties want no competition whatsoever. And I always like to say, in a country where you can watch any movie ever made on demand and get anything you want from Amazon in 24 hours, the idea that you got two shitty choices for politics doesn't make a lot of sense, um, but except for, you know, the, the incumbent protection racket. Um, but I would I would say that to your point about the issues is it's it's one that you don't have issues. OK, because you don't you know, you don't want to get pinged. I get it. But I think that's also the inherent weakness, which is believing that you can pull a little bit over here and a little bit over there. You're not going to upset anybody. Right. You'll you'll be all things to all people, which is fundamentally it's a fallacy. Um, and I think that I think back to uh, Charlie, you know, in Rapan, in your home state of Wisconsin in 1854, uh, a, a group called the Republican Party got together, uh, not for a muscular and moral for, foreign policy, not for lower tax rates and fiscal responsibility and, you know, individual liberty, but for to get rid of slavery. Right. right? Like it, was anti, it was the anti-slavery right. party. That was their issue. Uh, split the Whigs, right, from northern businessmen to southern slaveholders. And, you know, six years later, they elect a guy named Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Um, and it's a uh, look, all parties evolve. So that's not the issue. But the point was, is that they had a belief system. Right. It was couched. The initial conceit was in belief, not in reform. And I think that's an important distinction. I, I, I think that's I think that's exactly right, which is not to say that there's not the possibility that someone could emerge and say, are you sick of the status quo? Are you sick of the, this duopoly? The, the, you know, the problem is you need something really powerful and specific to overcome something as entrenched as the two-party system. And right. so I just simply think that saying, I think we need something different. I agree with that. 
and that's necessary to think that, but it's not sufficient. It's not going to get you, I mean, 1850, the country was ablaze already about slavery. So a new party formed around that issue didn't have to go out and persuade people that this is a big deal. Um, it was already there. It was happening. Um, and so if there ever is a third party um, or a, you know, a, a third party candidate, it's going to have to be something like that. The other big question, of course, is the fear that um, they will be spoilers in 2024. That's how Trump gets reelected or the people will waste their votes. Um, and I will say that their answers were a little bit inconsistent about 2024. Um, I talked with David Jolly, I think the week before, sure. and he was very adamant that they had no intention of getting involved in 2024, that this was not about presidential candidates. And I think that's an important point because no one wants to mess around with an election that might return Donald Trump to the presidency. And he was he wanted to be very, very clear on that. I wasn't sure that I heard that from Andrew Yang in my on my podcast last week. And I think they need to clear that up uh, ASAP. Right. Well, listen, much more to discuss. And I hope, Charlie, you'll come back and join me again soon. Uh, but until then, guys, I just want to remind you that tonight, uh, the game we're in will be playing at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, and I hope you'll tune in to Maya and Trigvi to get a better understanding of the fight we're in, not the fight we uh, would like to be in. Until then, Charlie, thanks so much. And everybody, y'all have a great day.